you want, you see on the screen a swath of land called the Sahel. I want to tell you about the Sahel. It's an area just south of the Sahara Desert that stretches 4,000 miles wide, just under the desert, as I said. In the Sahel, all moisture comes in four periods. May, June, July, and August. After that, not a drop of rain falls for eight months. The ground cracks, dries, and so does your feet and your hands. The winds of the Sahara pick up the dust and throw it thousands of feet in the air. And it then comes slowly drifting across western Africa as a fine grit. It gets into your mouth. It gets into your watch. It stops it. The year's food, of course, must all be grown in that four months. And people grow sorghum and milo in the small fields. October and November, these beautiful, are beautiful months. The granaries are filled. The harvest has come. The people sing and they dance. They eat two meals a day. The sorghum is ground between two stones to make a flour and then a mush with the consistency of yesterday's cream of wheat. The sticky mush is eaten hot. They roll it into balls between their fingers and dip it into a bit of sauce and then pop it in their mouth and the meal lies heavy on their stomachs so that they can sleep. December comes and the granaries start to recede. Many families omit the morning meal. Certainly by January, not one family in 50 is eating two meals a day. By February, the evening meals diminish. The meal shrinks even more during March and children succumb to sickness. You don't stay well on half a meal a day. April is a month that haunts everyone's memory. In it you hear babies crying in the twilight. Most of the days are passed with only an evening cup of gruel. Then inevitably it happens. A six or seven or eight-year-old boy comes running to his father one day, suddenly excited, Daddy, Daddy, we've got grain, he shouts. Son, you know we don't have any grain and haven't for weeks. Yes, we have, the boy insists. Out in the hut where we keep the goats, there's a little leather sack hanging on the wall. I reached up and put my hand down in it, Daddy. There was grain there. Give it to Mommy so that we can make flour and have something in our tummies tonight so we can sleep. The father stands motionless. Son, we can't do that, he explains softly. That's next year's seed grain. It's the only thing between us and starvation. We wait for the rain, and then we must use it. The rain finally arrived in May, and when they do, the young boy watches his father take the sack from the wall and does the most unreasonable thing imaginable. Instead of feeding his desperate, weakened family, he goes into the field with tears streaming down his face, and he takes this precious seed and he throws it away. He scatters it in the dirt. Why? 
because he believes in the harvest. The seed is his. He owns it. He can do anything he wants. The act of sowing it hurts so much that he cries openly. But as the African pastors say when they preach on Psalms 126, brothers and sisters, this is God's law of the harvest. Don't expect to rejoice later unless you're willing to sow in tears now. And so I ask you, how much would it cost you to sow in tears? I don't mean just giving God something from your abundance, but finding a way to say, I believe in the harvest, therefore I will give what makes no sense. The world would call me unreasonable to do this. But I must sow regardless in order that I may someday celebrate with songs of joy. And so my question to all of us this morning on the eve of the New, Year, New Year's turn, what is your mission. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation, the 10th chapter, as we determine the relationship between this story and the question that the title conveys, what is your, what is our, what is my mission? Revelation, the 10th chapter. Children, open your Bibles, and if you don't come and see me, I'll give you one. We want you to follow along as we read different portions of Revelation, the 10th chapter. I have four points to share with you. First of all, verse number one. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow around his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like a pillar of fire. Yeah. Wow, amen. There's a picture, a depiction of this very thing that John is writing about. And the question we want to ask first and foremost, number one, who is this mighty angel? In order to answer with sureness, we have to look elsewhere in the Bible. And notice what it says in Revelation, the first chapter, that relates to what I just read to you in Revelation, the 10th chapter. So go back to the very beginning of the book of Revelation, and let's look at verse 13 through 16. John is in vision... He hears a voice, and then notice what it says in verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair are white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as it refines in a furnace, and his voice the sound of many waters. He had in his hand seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. If you compare the two passages of Scripture, you can't but arrive at the conclusion 
that that mighty angel of Revelation 10 has the same description as this being in Revelation 1 that is called the Son of Man. Well, there's one more to look at, though, before we make our absolute determination. Let's go to Daniel, the 10th chapter, and see yet another description of a heavenly being that fits perfectly with the two that we already read. Daniel, the 10th chapter. And look at what Daniel saw in vision. Do you have Daniel 10? Okay, let's look at verses 5 and 6. Oh, I'll read for. Now in the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man in linen, whose waist was girded with a with gold of Euphas, his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torch of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words were like the voice of a multitude. Again, if you compare those three passages of Scripture, you can only come to one conclusion that that mighty angel of 10 is the same as Revelation 1, is the same of Daniel 10, and it is none other than Jesus. It's Jesus. There's no doubt about that. But now let's look at verse 2 and 8. Remember, we're headed towards what is your mission. Okay, so back to Revelation 10. Now we're going to add verse 2, but we're also going to look at 8. Look what it says. Jesus had in his hand a little book opened, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So now this great being, which we figured out the mighty angel is Jesus, had a little book open in his hand. So the second question we want to answer today is what is the little book opened? And in order to answer that, we have to go, whoops, I'm going to go back. I want to show you something interesting. The Greek word for open is anoigo. That's how it's pronounced. It's on the bottom of your screen there in Greek. The, the English pronunciation, an, oi, go. Notice it says to open, implying that it was shut. But now it is open and it's in his hand, Jesus' hand. And so we, we must figure out the question, the answer to the question, what is the little book who's open in Jesus' hand? In order to do that, we go back to the book of Revelation, or book of Daniel, excuse me. Go back to Daniel, only this time the last chapter of the book. And notice what it says. Daniel 12, 5 through 9. Okay, I'll start with four. Did everybody have it? But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this side of the river and the other on that side of the river bank, and one said to the man clothed in what? He's clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river. And he asked, the angel asked this being above the water, how long 
shall the fulfillment of these wonders be. And now notice the man who is clothed in linen, who was above the waters, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lived forever and ever that it shall be for a time, time, and a half a time, and then the power of the holy people, and when the power of the holy people have been completely shattered, all things shall be finished. And Daniel writes, although I heard, I did not understand, and then I said to that man above the water, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Daniel, go your way, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Wow. Did you remember and notice that in Revelation 10, it said that this mighty angel held his hand up and swore by him who lived forever and ever? And now we come over to Daniel 12, and we see that Jesus, this being, is there and tells Daniel to shut up the words of the book until the time of the end. So the question we wanted to answer, number two, is what is the little book open? It is the book of Daniel. Over in Revelation 10th chapter, you're reading the prophecy that one day that little book closed by Jesus' command in Daniel would be opened. All right, this is cool, but we're not done answering questions yet. Now we want to look at Revelation, the 10th chapter, 8 through 11. Let's go back to Revelation 10. Oh, I want to get to the end. Not because I'm in a hurry, but because I can't wait for the punchline. Oh, I love this. When I learned this as a brand new convert at the age of 26, I fell off my chair. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. By the way, you do understand the sea and the earth dominion over the whole world. Jesus. Man, all these depictions. This is Jesus. And he was told to go take that book, verse 9. So I went to the angel and said, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many people, nations, tongues, and kings. Which leads us to the third question, and that is, what three things was John told to do? What was the first thing? He said, John, take the little book opened. Then he was told, eat the little book opened. And then he was told, you must prophesy again about many people, nations, tongues, and kings. Those three things he was told. And so the question arises, number four, how are we to understand Daniel 10? Ah, the pay dirt. <laughs> Number one, you must know the books of Daniel and Revelation. The prophetic books. 
they were provided for us particularly for the time of the the time of the end and number two we must preach the books of Daniel and Revelation take a look at Ezekiel the second chapter Go to Ezekiel, the second chapter. Let me show you an example of this in the Bible. This is not something new at all. So we can look at Ezekiel, the second chapter, starting in verse 6. In case you've never read this, this is incredible. By the way, it also tells me if you haven't, then you haven't read through your Bible entirely. You need to do it on a periodic basis because it all makes sense. Verse 6, Ezekiel 2. And you, son of man, he's talking now, God is talking now to Ezekiel, calls him the son of man. Do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and horns, thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Who is God referring to when he tells Ezekiel this? The Israelite community. Yeah. Don't be afraid of them. And then he says, you shall speak my words to them. Whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not rebel like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you of bread. Too many pages. Now, when I looked There was a hand stretched out to me. Behold, a scroll of the book of a book was in it. And then he spread it before me. And there was written on the side and on the outside. And written on there were laments and mournings and woe. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and... Go speak to the house of Israel. And so, folks, we must know the books of Daniel and Revelation. Why? Because we must preach the books of Daniel and Revelation. And we are to preach it to who? Who? Everybody, everybody, even Italians. What's your mission? Do you understand what this is telling us? When I was a brand new convert, I told you I fell out of my chair. For I discovered that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was prophesied to come into existence in the last days for a special purpose to preach the books of Daniel and Revelation. And I'm not being arrogant. I'm not being conceited. I do not belong to an exclusive country club. Folks, we are a prophetic movement. We have a prophetic message. The other churches... Don't. Yes, what they're doing is the work of the Lord, but the Lord uses their work to bring them to a higher understanding, which is why we exist. And did you hear what he said in Ezekiel? They don't want to hear it. So is that going to make it fun? No, it isn't. We're going to sow in tears, folks. Because we're going to reach out a hand to help and they are going to bite it as if we are attacking them to hurt them. 
But we have a mission. Our mission is to preach the books of Daniel and Revelation with love because the books of Daniel and Revelation are about Jesus Christ. And so what is your mission? I hope it's to understand that the book of Revelation, chapter 10, talks about a group of people who would come into existence at the very end for a purpose to preach the three angels' messages, to prepare a world to meet Jesus Christ face to face. I do suppose you know these people. I have a letter from them for you. Dear Paradise Church family, as the year of 216 draws to a close, I stop to take time to remember and ponder upon God's goodness and faithfulness towards me and my family. No, no thank you list would be complete without mentioning you. It has been a year and a half since I parted ways, we parted ways, and yet the memories stay sealed in my mind. Thank you for your continuing, continuing prayer and messages of support. The road isn't always easy, but God always keeps true to his promises as reads, as reads the verses often quoted by many of you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the righteous right hand. By the grace of God, we have started many different outreach efforts at, evangelism, at the Evangelistic Center here in Paris. One of which I am really excited about, it's called the Prayer Stop. Where we actually pray with people in a park. God has really blessed this effort as little by little people are starting to come so we can pray with them. We have also started language conversation classes for university students, and we currently are studying with 16 non-Adventist do to a Bible and archaeology seminar that we put on. I am really excited about three other projects that will, that will see the light of day next year. After work gives community people an opportunity to make friends while eating a good vegetarian meal. We also kick off a marriage seminar for community couples that are living together and are toying with the idea of marriage. Last week, we met with the mayor of the city of Paris, and they are going to allow us to hold a health expo in the town hall, which will be very good for our church's visibility. Yes. Now, why am I reading this? This fits the sermon perfectly. Do you understand in France, if they walked up to someone in that park and said, we want to pray for you, if that person complained, he would be arrested. You don't mention the Bible in France. If you do, you get ostracized. And we spend a number of hours on the phone trying to figure out how to outsmart the secular mind that has written off religion, God, and the Bible. And look at what he came up with. So he sets up a sign, he sits in the park. If somebody comes up and asks him 
nobody can condemn them. But if he goes up to them, he could be arrested. That's why I'm reading this. We got to find ways. In fact, I'm excited about the prayer stop. I, I was hoping somebody goes, I want to do that. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, it goes on. Out of all the blessings Jessica and I have received, the one that is on top of the list is our soon-to-be-here baby. Now you see why he's putting his hand on her. (laughs) That's little Julio. Please pray so the Lord will give us patience and wisdom so we can guide our child on the path to heaven. Speaking of children on the road to heaven, I've, I've liked to say a word to the youth of the Paradise Church. Dear youth, Jesus will never fail you, and it is close to Jesus that you will experience true happiness and find the meaning of your life. I thank the Lord for the wonderful time we were able to spend together while in Las Vegas. Know that each one of you has a special place in my heart. And so as we look forward to ministries in different countries, different cultures, and different challenges, it's good to know that we can trust the same faithful God who never changes. It is with the encouragement to keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus that I would like to wish every one of you of the Paradise SDA Church a happy and blessed 217. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace this coming year. Know that you are prayed for and that you keep, that you keep, I keep fond memories of you. Kind regards from the three of us, Julio, Jessica, and the baby, and soon we'll know whether it's a boy or a girl. Folks, we've got a mission, and we have a message. And do you know there's people within the church trying to disrupt that that logic? But you just read it with me in Revelation 10. A group of people would show up at the very end and open that closed book so that people can understand that Jesus is coming soon, and he wants all to be ready. Father, I thank you for the challenge This morning to each and every one, may the Paradise Church rise to the occasion and everybody participate in some way, Lord, to support the ministries that are already going on and even expand into other areas that you may bring to our attention, like the prayer stop. And that you would be with Pastor Julio and Jessica in a very special way as they lead out in a very difficult field. Now, Lord, I want you to bless everyone here for 2017. And when they are blessed, I want you to remind them of this prayer so that we would know that it is you and you alone that is the one who blesses us. So keep us close to you and working together with you and for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.